So Europe, it's not only blue with yellow stars. It's a rainbow. It's blue for freedom and democracy. It's red for social values. It's green for the protection of environment. It's yellow for the culture. We can hardly picture Europe as the center of the world in economic sense when we see China, US around us. But we should do everything that Europe remains the center of the dreams of all the people of the world. And that's something which is our major task. And that's, by the way, the direction in which also the Green Deal goes. Transition to a more sustainable economy and society is unavoidable. I hope the letters are big enough. Because when, whenever somebody will tell you, but, stop him immediately. You cannot discuss but, but how and in what way. But, but it's simply not existing. Humans are supposed to be intelligent. It's high time to prove it. We have to fix the broken compass. This is the last uh, serious slide. Why the changes are so difficult in practice. This is uh, based on experiences of my political life. While the challenges we face require deep system change, long-term orientation, practically all public institutions, all policymakers, all private institutions, companies are still short-term orientated. And these two things simply don't go together. So all the profits are maximized for the next year. By the way, all political cycles are four years. Everybody is looking through the optic how to sustain and not how to, how to sustain its, itself and its profit and not in the longer term how we can all survive. Second, production and consumption systems are based on the logic of consumerism fueled by quantity-driven profits and growth measured by GDP. The best would be to say that you will not reach, that's actually how I try to explain the GDP, you will not reach your goal by walking faster if you are walking in the wrong direction. So that's practically where we are. Markets are core mechanisms for the interaction among economic actors, producers, consumers. Production capital, as I said, it's overvalued, overrewarded labor, not so signals to economic actors should change. The existing lock in and vested interest. Today, a lot of private sector knows exactly how they would need to look like 20 years or so from now. But unfortunately, they also know how they look today. So how to travel that road, it's the difficult part, and sustain profitable and at the same time give a reason for existence. And finally, a transition to a more sustainable economy and society will only be possible if it's just, fair and inclusive. And uh, we have seen many of the things which are many movements around us, in particular the movement of the young generation. Uh, so Greta, it's not in the first place, the symbol of the awakened young generation. It's more the symbol of the failure of our generation. And I think what would be important is to organize our ourselves around the SDGs to create a kind of intergenerational agreement, a program for the future generations which would put sustainability first. I was trying to push the commission that this would be the subtitle of the Green Deal. Unfortunately, I think they have mis missed the opportunity because giving a clear political signal that we do understand that we need to change behavior and to act with high responsibility for the future generations than we have did in our generation. It's an essential message which the future generations need to hear. So circular economy, it's not a new concept. It's the oldest concept on the earth. All nature is organized based on the principles of circular economy. That's why it would make common sense to embrace it and behave accordingly. In essence, there is only question we have to answer. Do we agree that we humans are part of the nature too? Because of the answer to that question, it's positive, then we know how we have to accommodate. But if somebody is still doubting about the answer to that question, then you should ask for the advice. Your most famous detective, Hercule Poirot, 
When he was asked why he is speaking about himself always in the third person, he replied something like that. If one is such a genius like me, it is very important to establish a healthy distance to himself. <laughs> so, I think that's a major lecture for us humans. If we uh, think that we are more intelligent than the others, and we are, then we have to establish a healthy distance to ourselves and take the responsibility which we have to govern the rest of living species with which we share this planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. So we know can have some experience with the audience, <laughs> questions and answers, of course. Um, will there be some questions? Uh, nous sommes arrivés à ce point où nous pouvons, et je vois déjà un premier bras qui se lève et un micro qui se précipite vers vous. U kunt nu, nu gewillig vragen stellen aan meneer Potosnik. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Potosnik. I'm Piet van Meerbeek van Braal, uh, Urban Movement for Brussels. I'm very enthusiastic about your the, um, ambition, the environmental ambition of the Commission, and about the, the, the fact that the Commission recognizes the need to rethink our economy uh, fundamentally. So that's very important. And your uh, example of uh, the uh, light bulb uh, company was capital, of course. But I think this example uh, shows us that there's still a little backlash. There's still a problem. They might still raise new problems if we don't push the fundamental thinking any further. Because this light bulb company would have no incentives anymore to sell you light bulbs, but it will still have major incentives to sell you as much light as he can, which is, of course, not necessarily what we want. So if we don't think this uh, fundamental vision of our economy further, we might end up with a circular economy that is owned and driven by Uber and Amazon, with all the problems on this kind of jobs they create and with all the problems of the uh, competition between, for instance, and a car park owned and driven by Uber and uh, cycles uh, and uh, or tram race. That is not the kind of development that I would like. So don't we have to ask ourselves, beside the questions, what kind of resources we use and how we use it, don't we have to ask ourselves other questions, namely, who owns the resources and what do we use it for? Sure. <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, the things which I was telling you are at least 10 years ahead of the things which will happen in reality. And, uh, of course, when the example of the light bulbs, it's very nice because at the end, you know, it's true, you, you have to rationalize the use of light by itself. But if the producer is, would produce a light bulb which would last all your life, which they can if they want, but they are not incentivized, of course, that would mean that they are using much less resources, they are much less polluting, and everything is actually better than it is the current situation. So it is absolutely the step in the right direction. And for example, it's already working in practice. You have the, the Amsterdam airports, Schiphol, it's uh, with Philips organized in that way. So it's possible, and also today, it's technologically, it's possible. Many of the things which were Many of the ideas about circular economy were existing decades ago, but they were not possible because of, uh, of uh, the importance of the access to data, to information which would be given to the citizens that they can use those information to behave more rationally. And uh, uh, that's why I also believe that the digitalization, if used in the proper way, uh, it could... Uh, help a lot and uh, uh, empowering consumer uh, about the information which we all need to do the right decisions. But uh, yeah, it's uh, at the end uh, you can, so my next step would be of course uh, discussing about how we measure the growth because nobody's opening that question yet. 
and it's obviously that we are measuring it in the wrong way, that we are incentivizing something which, which goes in the wrong direction. But it's not only how you measure it on the national level, it's also how you measure it on company level, because if some things are simply not part of the costs, and if they are not considered as part of, part of the incentive, dot, then basically the signal which you are giving to the producer today, which is pretty much still across the place, even if we have in our treaties uh, polluter pays principle. Come on, that's in practice nowhere working, and we know that. And uh, it's, if you do not record all those things, basically, in the cost structure, then producing more, selling more, do it because you are not punished for that at all. So you produce more, and then somebody will take care. If, if there is a problem, that, that's, that's then political or policy or whatever. And that's why I firmly believe that until we really set a system which will at least fundamentally change the, the way how we drive the production and consumption. And uh, uh, if, if it's not sending, if we are not sending those incentives in the same direction, then we try then to send it with the legislation. It will never work. It will never work. But rethinking the concept of ownership, uh, by the way, you have seen that I have put it uh, also in one of the slides rethinking the concept of ownership. We have had some revolutionary ideas uh, that the producer of the product would keep the ownership of the molecules, but of course you can go to more societally uh, uh, way of thinking how, how basically you organize the whole societies and how you organize the whole economies. But, you know, it's uh, in, in universities, I don't know how it's now, but I doubt that it's different than it was in my times. But there were two, two prevailing uh, uh, theories at that time. One was the neoclassical, classical, neoclassical and classical theory. And one was the Keynesian theory. And Keynesian theory, because you look in economy everything through the optic of growth. So growth is good, full stop. So if you want, according to Keynesian theory, you can create the growth, which is good, by uh, uh, increasing the consumption. So the whole point is you should spend more, you should buy more, and this is good for you. So today I would name that theory suicidal theory. But uh, that days when we were at university, but I'm still quite sure that this theory is st still pretty much uh, taught. But uh, I think that, that economists as a science uh, have a very, very serious challenge ahead. Because the way how uh, the, the economy as such a, is defined and uh, the way how, how we, we are taught in that it, it's simply not, uh, not contributing to well-being at all. So it's contributing to something which we measure today as growth. And a lot of growth in the past was, and that was also my intention to tell you, that a lot of the growth which we recorded in the past was actually uh, bad growth. So it was growth without taking into consideration the costs which occurred, but were not paid by those who created the growth, but were later paid by the society. So GDP, it's a, an interesting concept if you have, uh, because nobody talks about the level of GDP, which is the only thing which is important at the end because you go to the shop, you don't go there and say, oh, I'm growing 10%, can I get that and that? But you are going there, that's hard money which I have in my pocket. So if, you would, if I would ask you, would you prefer to earn 100 euros and grow 10%, or if you would prefer to earn 1,000 euros and grow 1%, by the way, at the end of the day, we both have additional 10 euros. I know what will be your answer, but our uh, policymakers all talk about the economic growth, 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 growth. The rest, it's not existing. So it's, uh, these are all very, very debatable concepts which we will need to start discussing or we will not move the, the whole tanker, if I can say so, in the right direction. So changing the compass, yes.